Good evening. Everyone, good evening and welcome. I'm Mark Green, president of IRI, and on behalf of our board and staff, I must say that I'm honored to see so many of you here this evening. I'm also honored to be sharing the stage tonight with my friend and counterpart, Indy Eyes Ken Wallach. After, let's see, how should I put this, a rough and tumble campaign season, tonight our goal is to help all of you turn the page by telling all of you a different story. It's a story of bipartisanship and collaboration for a cause that goes to the very heart of American leadership. Just as importantly, this story is built upon a set of core but fundamental and universal values. It goes back to 1982 and President Reagan's historic speech before the British Parliament. It was that speech that essentially launched both NDI and IRI. In 1982, President Reagan said, we must be staunch in our conviction that freedom is not the sole prerogative of a lucky few, but the inalienable and universal right of all human beings. Now, note that he didn't say merely all Republicans. He didn't even say all Americans. He said instead, all man and woman kind. That is our guidepost, that is our motto, and that is tonight's story. When you leave this hall, I hope you'll agree with the two of us that the mission to advance democracy and human liberty has never been more important than it is today. IRI and NDI exist to help citizens all around the world exercise the fundamental right to choose their own government. Because as a famous person once said, what people have the capacity to choose, they have the ability to change. Tonight I have the honor of introducing that famous person, former Secretary of State and Chair of NDI, Madeleine Albright. Her personal story Her personal story, as you know, is inspirational. When she was just an infant during World War II, her family fled her native Czechoslovakia. Just a few years later, as a young girl, her family was driven into exile once again, this time by communism. Today, that young girl who saw and felt communism firsthand is one of our great champions of democracy and human dignity. In 1983, as IRI and NDI were just being created, she was a Georgetown professor already working to increase the role of women in politics all around the world. In the 1990s, as the global democracy movement began to take root, Ambassador Albright spearheaded efforts at the UN to push for democratic reform in communist Europe. During her time as secretary, she forged stronger ties with European allies, and she worked tirelessly for the cause of international peace. In 2000, she became chair of NDI's board of directors, and Ken likes to boast that she hasn't missed a board meeting in 15 years. Now, uh, the IDI, IRI directors out there, I think I can see some of you. I uh, <laughs> trust you're taking notes and keeping tabs on this. On a personal note, I got a chance to see her in action, endless action, during my first observation mission as IRI president. It was in Ukraine, and she was chairing NDI's mission team. And I saw in Madeleine Albright someone who didn't merely push an NDI agenda or cause, but someone who spoke passionately about America's natural kinship with the disciples of democracy wherever they may be found. In 2010, Madeleine Albright said in an interview, it took me quite a long time to develop a voice, and now that I have it, I'm not going to be silent. 
and she isn't, and thank goodness. There is no mistaking where she stands when it comes to the cause of democracy and liberty. Ladies and gentlemen, before I turn it over to Ken to introduce the rest of our panelists, please join me in welcoming former Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright. Good evening, I want to join Mark and IRI in expressing our appreciation to you for joining us tonight. For those of you who have attended separate NDI Democracy Award events and IRI Freedom Dinners, we thought this was an appropriate time to consolidate. An appropriate moment to have a serious discussion on these issues with our two chairmen and to hear from the former Danish Prime Minister and NATO Secretary General. First, the consolidation saves you one more taxi fare or a parking fee, <laughs> and with apologies to the Ritz-Carlton chefs, one more rubber chicken dinner. <laughs> Second, and more important, we thought that the seemingly unnatural act in today's Washington of a joint NDI-IRI gathering just could have a demonstration effect. For our two institutes, however, this cooperation is just another workday. We are dedicated to the same universal values that reflect the aspirations of people in every region of the world. This is our mutual solidarity network of small d Democrats, whether they are Republican, Democrat, liberal, social democratic, democratic socialist, centrist, conservative, or independent. NDI has always been mindful that, as former President Jimmy Carter said in receiving our Democracy Award in 1990, we are not wise people dealing with the unwise. We are not superior people dealing with those who are less than we. We are dealing with equals who have dreams and hopes and some fears about the future, who share with us a desire for a better world. As we know, democracy is imperfect wherever it is practiced including here at home. But our role, to which President Carter alluded, is not to lecture, instruct, export, or impose. Those who are part of the democracy support community here and abroad, including governments, intergovernmental organizations, and non-governmental groups, many of which are represented in this room. What we all have in common is the understanding that what happens in one place, for good or for evil, affects us all. Contrary to that famous tagline in tourism marketing, what happens, let's say, in Moscow or Mogadishu doesn't stay there. Vaclav Havel once explained the difference between hope and optimism. Hope, he said, is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. NDI and IRI are in the hope and optimism business. This has also been the business of successive administrations and Congresses, both Democratic and Republican. We are grateful for the presence here of representatives of the administration, particularly from USAID and the Department of State, members of Congress and staff, our fellow non-governmental organizations, including the National Endowment for Democracy, the Solidarity Center, SIPE, and IFAS, political leaders from overseas, many from Europe, those listed in the program who have provided support for this dinner, and the board and staff members of our institutes who lead our efforts each day. Finally, I want to recognize our partners in more than 60 countries who are struggling often against tremendous odds to promote and protect their fundamental rights and to create better lives for themselves and their fellow citizens. We dedicate this evening to them. NDI and IRI have been fortunate to benefit from the leadership of Madeleine Albright and John McCain. And it is my pleasure tonight to introduce the Senator. And I will do so as he would wish, with brevity. <laughs> he has been known as a patriot, a maverick, a man of courage and conviction. But on a very personal level, he has personified the commitment to democratic solidarity 
which we recognize tonight. Again, I refer to Vaclav Havel, who once spoke about the sense of isolation felt by a dissident and the importance of outside validation and support, which are needed to break that sense of isolation. Senator McCain, perhaps based on his own experience, understands that deep and abiding need for solidarity. Whether in Washington or on his many travels, he meets, he always meets, with virtually any Democratic activist who could benefit emotionally or politically from a handshake, a hug, a picture, or a conversation. This says more about Senator McCain, the person, than any speech or piece of legislation. If we could get a round of applause, please, for our second chairman. Um, as many of you may already know, Andrea Mitchell, who was to moderate tonight's discussion, has been in Havana and therefore will not be with us tonight. Uh, that is what we call bittersweet news. While we will miss her presence, we are fortunate that Fred Hyatt, the longtime editorial page editor of the Washington Post, will be our moderator. Fortunate because there is no journalist, editorial writer, or editor who has been a more articulate and consistent advocate for democracy, along with international and U.S. efforts to advance it. In his last op-ed piece, only nine days ago, Fred expressed succinctly that mix of hope and optimism. Yes, he said, democracy is still the best system, and it will survive, I think, I hope, <laughs> if we work at it. Thank you, Fred, for being an important part of this evening. And please begin by eating your salads, and we will have dinner a little later. And I, and I ask the We have an angry panel, mob here. <laughs> and the panelists, please come to the table. All right, please finish your salads. <laughs> um, could I ask you all to quiet down, please? So we can have our conversation. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to Ken for the introduction. Um, you know, last year, I took my family to see Hamilton, which, uh, <clears throat> as you know, is a considerable investment. <clears throat> and when we got to the theater, we discovered that uh, Lynn manuel was not going to be performing that night for the first time ever. Goodness. So I know how disappointing it is to find one of these in your program. <clears throat> <laughs> I, I apologize for not being Andrea Mitchell. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the other stars of the show were Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson were both fabulous. So uh, hopefully you will not be disappointed. I know them well. <laughs> <laughs> well, that brings me to my first question, Senator. Uh, now that you've entered middle age, both of you. I wonder if you would reflect a little bit on 
you, you both, you obviously came to your passion for human rights and democracy on very different paths, but have brought a commitment to it that most of your counterparts and colleagues do not have. And I wonder if you'd be willing to reflect a little bit on why or how that came about. Uh, Secretary, maybe we thank could you. start with you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for being here with us. And let me just say how delighted I am to be here with Senator McCain, because we have done many things together. And because it is a wonderful coincidence, we actually went to Czechoslovakia, when it was still called that, together uh, for the first elections. And we have been friends and colleagues ever since. And so, John, it is my pleasure and honor to do this with you. Um, um, well, I'd like to thank Mark for his introduction, but he stole the answer, uh, because of my background is the answer. And I, uh, my father was a Czechoslovak diplomat, and um, when the Nazis marched in to Czechoslovakia, in March 1939, after the Munich Agreement, um, he wanted to go and be with the government in exile in London. And so we were refugees there, and um, really uh, grateful to be there. Uh, my father was with the government in exile. He broadcast over BBC um, through the Czech section in order to talk about the importance of democracy and support that came from that. Then we went back to uh, Czechoslovakia, and then my father was made ambassador to Yugoslavia. <clears throat> and many of you have heard this, but the little girl in the national costume that gave flowers at the airport, that's what I did for a living. Uh, <laughs> and then the communists took over, and we came to the United States. And my father said on a regular basis that when we were in Europe, people said, we're so sorry your country's been taken over by a dictator. You're welcome here. What can we do to help you, and when are you going home? When we came to the United States, people said, we're so sorry, your country's been taken over by a terrible system. You're welcome here. What can we do to help you, and when will you become a citizen? Mm. And he said, that is what makes America different. And I think that, um, um, and my passion for democracy came from the fact that it was taken away from my family twice, and that uh, there, whoever thought that I would have the opportunity to be in the Thomas Jefferson's job um, and have the possibility of talking about what democracy is about and helping those who want to help themselves be a part of a democratic system. And so I am so dedicated to it and it's something that is difficult and I will continue to work on it and the National Democratic Institute and the International Republican Institute and the National Endowment for Democracy, I think is the most fabulous way of working on it because it is difficult. But my passion comes from my background. I am a grateful refugee and an American. Thank you. <laughs> well, I know you were also born overseas. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, first of all, thank you, Fred. Thanks for being here, and thanks for your thoughtful views on the world today and the challenges that we face. And uh, I find myself, uncharacteristically, with the Washington Post, largely in agreement uh, with. <laughs> That's off the that. record. <laughs> and it's nice to see old friends and enemies here tonight. Thank you all for. <laughs> for being here, and Madeline, thank you for your continued uh, great work uh, for freedom and democracy and a voice of sanity in a rather insane time that we're living in uh, today. And I've never been asked that question uh, before, and I guess that, uh, um, and, uh, th thinking out loud, I guess it has something to do with my view of life and the world and sacrifice and a bit of a romantic that I am. When I was about 12 years old, I stumbled upon a book called For Whom the Bell Tolls. And I started reading it, and I didn't stop until I finished. And Robert Jordan, the guy who left Montana to go fight for a cause that he believed in, even though he knew it was flawed and it was going to lose, and was willing to sacrifice his life for a cause that he had become a bit disillusioned with, and he said, the world is a, 
a wonderful place, and I hate to leave it, but it's worth dying for, is something that's always guided me all of my life. All of my life, I've had a romantic view of, of life and the world and what we can do to make it a better place. Thank you both. <laughs>
And I think the, that in Libya, we knew what we had to do, but we didn't do it. We just, uh, we just walked away. We should, you know, the old line about ignoring the lessons uh, of history. And I also believe that all of us, including me, underestimate, underestimated this, this, this evil, this, this virus, this, this, um, this poison that has infected the Muslim world at a level where I don't think any of us ever really anticipated. And the, the unique challenges that it, that it presents as it metastasizes into different parts of the world. I believe that that's one of the great challenges for leadership in the 21st century. Madam Secretary, have you been surprised at the pushback of the authoritarians? Uh, and and well, what do you think explains it? I, I have been surprised. I do think that we were euphoric about what was happening in Central and Eastern Europe. And, and I have to say, I especially, with my Czechoslovak background and Václav Havel coming and uh, saying all those amazing things in terms of what could happen. By the way, when I, I didn't know Václav Havel, and I went to see him on an NDI uh, mission, and I'm handing him a book that my father wrote on Czechoslovakia, and he said, I know who you are. You're Mrs. Fulbright. And I said, no, I'm Mrs. Albright, and that, <laughs> that's how it all started. Um, but let me just say this, is that um, I feel the following way, which is, and to go back to my story, the thread of my life has always been is when America has not been there, terrible things happen. Munich was an agreement between the British and French with the Germans and Italians over the heads of Czechoslovaks, and the US was not there. I was a little girl in London when the Yankees came, and it made all the difference in the world uh, to see them and the hope that they gave and generally coming as the liberating force. When, as a result of decisions made during World War II, Czech, Europe was divided, um, and the Soviet Union, quote, liberated Eastern Europe. I could go on, but the thread of my life has always been that the U.S. needs to be present. And nothing gave me greater honor than to represent the United States and understanding that we are the indispensable nation. The thing about the indispensable word is that there's nothing in the definition of that that says alone. It just means that we need to be engaged. And so Americans don't like the word multilateralism. It has too many syllables and it ends in an ism. But all it means are partnerships. And I think that this is where the issue has come down in terms of how American power is deployed. And one of the things that I know, we're just going through a transition. I have been transitioned into, and I have done the transitioning. The latter is more fun. But the bottom thing, line that I know is no president comes in and has a clean slate. And President Obama was somebody that was elected in order to end the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And the Iraq war is one of the greatest disasters in American foreign policy being based on incorrect information. And you cannot impose democracy, that's an oxymoron. Um, and the bottom line here is that many mistakes were made, but I can fully understand what has happened. And I talk about what I call the Karzai effect. Uh, a lot of lives were lost um, in Afghanistan. We have the Secretary General of NATO with us tonight, and NATO lives. And not only did Karzai not say thank you but, uh, for all of that, but he blamed us for all the mistakes. And so we have to understand what the American people uh, have felt and thought, and think why should we make all the sacrifices. And so I can understand this. And I do think that American power is essential in partnership uh, with the help of Congress, where there is the idea that maybe there would be a vote or maybe not, and I think there is the responsibility for this and the responsibility of the executive and legislative branch to work together on behalf of democracy, which doesn't always have to be done with troops, but does have to be done with support for those that want to help others with democracy, not impose it. Well, <laughs> I know you've, you've heard, uh, you've read, and my guess is you've heard foreigners, foreign leaders who you both meet with ask whether the era of U.S. leadership is coming to an end, and uh, not just 
with the election of a president who has expressed doubts about the alliance, but with Brexit, with illiberal regimes coming to power uh, in NATO countries, uh, Turkey, Hungary, to some extent Poland, uh, with Brexit, with, with uh, possibly Le Pen coming uh, into power in, in France, and, and in any case with a president who is talking very differently about US leadership what do you think? What do you tell people when they ask? Is, is something fundamental changing? Let me just say, after Tuesday night, I went to Prague on Wednesday and met with various officials there and told them to calm down for a while till we figure out what really is going on. Uh, but the bottom line is that I fully believe that Americans have to be engaged internationally. Uh, I am deeply troubled by <clears throat> walls and isolationism, and I know that the world doesn't work if the U.S. is not involved. The question is, on what terms? And I do, I believe in NATO. I, I, uh, uh, you know, my life has been so weird in terms of the coincidences. The fact that my father was ambassador in Yugoslavia means I actually understand the language and I uh, know what's going on, spend an awful lot of time on that and that NATO was basically created after the, Czechoslo the coup in Czechoslovakia. And I was honored to be the one that helped to expand NATO, which I think was the right thing to do. Um, I do think that what has to happen is there have to be partnerships, and there can't be three riders, but we cannot scare our allies and friends by making statements that don't make any sense um, in terms of uh, you know, uh, kind of agreeing that Ukraine, uh, that the Russians aren't there, uh, or scaring our friends in the Baltics, or having doubts about the sanctity of Article 5. So there are many aspects of this, but the problem here is, and you all are a part of this, I, it always takes me about 10 minutes to get to the media. Um, <laughs> I think you all need, you did it, and, and really what is an amazing uh, op-ed on democracy. But I think that we need the help of those that can explain things in something other than sound bites uh, about what this era is all about. I think we are in a different era. There's something about the system. I am a professor, and so in terms of political science, the system is not working. But it cannot work without the United States. And I think we need your help, Fred, and uh, of your um, uh, colleagues in terms of explaining why the world doesn't work if the United States is not involved. But the United States cannot and should not have to do it alone. We need partners and we need to have them fully involved and that's what I think um, if we had a different president would be going on. So the bottom line is I think we have to figure out where the Trump uh, administration is going on this because it is the most serious question that is out there. What is the role of the United States at this stage in the 21st century. George Shultz uh, is one of my heroes. <clears throat> he was one of the architects of the, when the Cold War victory, Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of State, close advisor to President Reagan. And he made some pretty strong, profound statements. And one of them was that all the diplomacy and all the strategy in the world has to be backed up by power. And we have not exercised that power. And the best example of that, of course, is the ongoing tragedy in Syria today. 400,000 and some slaughtered, 6 million refugees. Uh, tragedy on the scale, the likes of which we have not seen in 70 years. And the slaughter goes on as we speak. And a very interesting thing happened in the last couple of weeks that largely unnoticed. For the first time, the Russians are launching airstrikes into Syria from an aircraft carrier with precision weapons, which, by the way, they are attacking hospitals. Who in this room will ever forget seeing the picture on the front page of every newspaper in America of the little boy sitting there in a chair covered with dirt and blood? They're little boys and girls covered with blood as we speak, enjoying this evening. And America has basically stood by and watched this genocide take place. Historians will judge us very harshly. And one of the seminal moments 
was when Bashar Assad crossed the so-called red line. Another sem and we did nothing. Another seminal moment was when uh, David Petraeus, <coughs> Bob Gates, Leon Panetta, and I believe Hillary Clinton went to the White House and recommended a no-fly zone and arming and training the Free Syrian Army. That was rejected. That was rejected, my friends. And when the statement was made to me and Lindsey Graham in the Oval Office by the President saying, I'm with you, we're going to not stand for this, he's crossed the red line, we're going to degrade Bashar Assad, we're going to upgrade the Free Syrian Army, and we're going to bring this to a halt. And a week later, I'm sitting in my office and we we'll see on CNN that we've decided not to do that. So were all of our allies. So were the Saudis who had planes on the runway ready to strike when they found out on CNN. My dear friends, we have a credibility problem because when the world's largest and most powerful nation makes a statement and then reneges on that, there is a now a go it alone attitude amongst most of these countries, including primarily in the Middle East today. That does not mean that we are not capable. That does not mean we don't have some of the finest military and men and women who are serving from the lowest to the highest rank. It doesn't mean that we don't have the best equipment and, and training of any country in the world. But the one thing we are lacking today is credibility. And I don't know what this president will do. I have not got a clue. But I do know this, that we've got to turn this around. Otherwise, we will see a Middle East with Russia as a major player for the first time since Anwar Sadat threw them out of Egypt in 1973. We will see an Asia Pacific region, by the way, turning down TPP will, um, um, again, historians will mark as the period of takeover of the Asian Pacific economy by China. And we will uh, continue to see a deterioration, not just of American influence and power, but a deterioration of the world order which has prevailed for the last 70 years with the United States of America setting the pace. We are in danger of losing that as we speak tonight. John, I respect you very much, but I think you're being unfair. I really do think that we are a democracy and the American people are the ones that elected Barack Obama to end the wars. The war which was a disaster and did in fact create that vacuum uh, and made it, most Americans didn't know anything about Islam, much less about the differences between the Shia and Sunni. And the way that that was all carried out without explanation to the American people has soured American people's mood about how and when to use force. I happen to agree with you that we should have a no-fly zone, that we should do more to protect the refugees, that, um, that we had a larger role. But I also believe that it is fair to understand the context of how this all happened. And the issue here is we're here talking about democracy. And democracy is about getting the people of a country to understand what responsibilities are how we motivate people. <clears throat> I, uh, <clears throat> when I do teach, I say every country makes foreign policy decisions based on five factors. The first is objective, geographical position. Russia actually changed its geographical position. But resources and the oil uh, <clears throat> revolution has made a difference as far as the United States is concerned. The second factor is subjective. How do the people feel? The people of the United States are sick and tired of fighting wars for other people. That's a statement of fact. The third factor is how the government is organized, the executive, legislative, Democrats, and Republicans. I think Congress has some responsibility for what did not happen and responsibilities about wanting to take votes or not wanting to take votes and what the budgets look like and all the arguments. And you had me testify, which I was happy to do, with George Shultz and Henry Kissinger. 
So I was the youngest person there. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, uh, but by, and, but but by but far the most articulate. With it. <laughs> but I, I do think, and the fourth factor are bureaucratic politics, which are reflected in uh, what the budget looks like. And the fifth factor, the role of individuals. And the individuals played a very large role in this. And we now have a new administration. The problems have gotten worse. And I think it's worth looking at the five factors and try to figure out where we can have an influence on, on how to make sure that the United States plays the role that it has to. But again, it is in a context. And I think we have to remember this. So OK, let, <clears throat> let me try and push it forward a little bit. Um, <clears throat> we, um, <clears throat> Senator, I've watched, uh, as you've had many of those meetings with <clears throat> beleaguered uh, democracy activists and human rights workers in many corners of the world, and I've seen how you always try to bring other members of Congress along with you, Democrat or Republican, anybody you can get interested in international affairs, basically. Uh, it seems to me you've tried to bring them along. <clears throat> so my question is, uh, what are the prospects in Congress, um, especially if we do end up with an administration that has a different view from yours on, on leading values, open trade, and so forth, what are the prospects that Congress, uh, wh what role can Congress play here? I think Congress has abrogated its responsibilities to a large degree. We do have a thing called the War Powers Act. Whether it's constitutional or not, it is constitutional until declared unconstitutional. I think that we have, should have, when the president made the decision that I just criticized, that Congress should have either endorsed yeah. or rejected that proposal. And, and by the way, just for a moment, um, I agree that we went into Iraq with misinformation. But I also would point out that Lindsey Graham and I are the ones that said, fire the Secretary of Defense, fire the general in charge, because we were losing. And thank God for David Petraeus and Ryan Crocker, the best combination I've ever seen in my life. Also in Afghanistan, everybody said, we shouldn't go into wars. My friends, we were attacked. We were attacked. And the person and, come and group that did that attack was in Afghanistan. Were we not going to respond to that? Stay out of wars? We're not going to respond to 9-11? Let me remind you that everybody in America wanted to go and take care of Osama bin Laden, and I'm glad we did. But right now, by the way, things are not that good. In, in, uh, and things are not that good in Afghanistan right now due to a whole bunch of uh, features. But I still believe that the, 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 the Congress of the United States has got to play their proper role as the co-equal branch of government. And part of that has got to do with exercise of appropriations. You, there is still ways that you can write a law that says no funds shall be spent to fill in the blank. And so I'm making no excuse for the, the lack of assertion, but I also would point out that the Constitution says that there's only one commander in chief and we all support that. So although we're co-equal branches of government, there can only be one uh, commander in chief, but we can restrain those activities. Well, look, after the way the Vietnam involvement ended was they cut off all the funds. Whether they should have or not, that's a matter for historians. So I do place blame on uh, to some responsibility to some degree on the Congress of the United States. And I hope that with this new administration that we can have a closer relationship and a more uh, cooperative spirit about an attitude and behavior. Um, look, my friends, the approval rating of Congress is 14%. Is there anyone besides a member of Congress or a paid staffer here who are in favor, approve of Congress? Please raise your hand. <laughs> if you just raise your hand, please don't drive an automobile around here tonight. You're a danger to yourself and others. One of my, one of my favorite lines, I landed at Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport the other day. A guy ran up to me and said, hey, 
I said, anybody ever tell you you look a lot like Senator John McCain? Yeah. I said, yeah. He said, doesn't it sometimes make you mad as hell? <laughs> so, so we as members of Congress have a job to do too as far as our credibility, as far as our leadership and responsibilities lie. Let me, let me end with uh, the challenge you gave us in journalism uh, and this very difficult issue of fake news and uh, particularly Russian uh, uh, propagation of, of propaganda, both openly and covertly. Um, <clears throat> I'd be interested, Senator, if you think Congress has a role to play in looking into that, but also more broadly, uh, you know, how, how, does, how does a democracy or a democratic West or NATO respond to this kind of challenge that we see coming from Russia in a, in a different way than we saw in the Soviet times? There's a new dimension to the challenges that we face, and it's just arisen in the last 10 to 15 years in a serious manner, and that's cyber. I asked uh, a chairman of our Joint Chiefs of Staff at a hearing, uh, what, what are the most significant challenges we face, and what are, how do we stack up with our adversaries? He said, we, we, we very, have significant advantages in every aspect of the challenges we face, except for one, cyber. My friends, when you look at what just happened in the last election. When you look at what uh, capabilities have even, uh, that are incredible, when you look at the betrayal of our most important intellectual property, when you look at capabilities of shutting down entire systems, when you look at negating everything that we have in space, all of these things that are now what we call cyber warfare, is a great challenge to the United States of America, and we're going to have to enlist the best and the brightest young people. And they're the ones that grew up on the video games. And we're going to have to enlist a whole lot of people, both military and civilian, to meet this challenge of cybersecurity and challenges to, that cyber present to our national security. It is the challenge of the 21st century. Uh, I agree with that, and I think that it is going to take a lot of work by the executive and legislative branch and the private sector. I have just spent several days uh, in Silicon Valley where there, in fact, are all kinds of questions about uh, privacy versus security and market forces and uh, how do you deal with what is really a double-edged sword of, of um, technology and all of this. I think it is the challenge of our time. Uh, I do think we need to see it in a global way in terms of a little bit the way the arms control agreements came about where uh, we need to have uh, full negotiations on it. It is the challenge of our time. I do think we need to recognize who Putin is. He is not a nice man. Uh, I <clears throat> used to be known as a Soviet expert. Uh, and I look at my library and I sometimes think archaeology. No, it is not. He is a KGB officer. And he is very good at the things that he is doing, which is the propaganda. And for us to think that he is a partner is a big mistake. It doesn't mean that we don't deal with the Russians, because I think that's the part that we do have to do, because they are playing a role in the Middle East, and they clearly are mucking around um, in Central and Eastern Europe through propaganda. I do think that we need to spend a lot of time on this, and we cannot be suckered into um, what um, is going on in terms of uh, trying, letting him do what we can't afford to have happen, which is divide Europe. Uh, and so I think this is a very big challenge. Um, and I, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I uh, among other things that I did in the early 90s, I went and I did a um, survey of all of Europe after the end of the Cold War. And we had focus groups and um, questionnaires, and I'll never forget a focus group outside of Moscow where this man stood up and he said, I'm so embarrassed. We used to be a superpower and now we're Bangladesh with missiles. They are having an identity crisis. They need a shrink. Uh, but what has happened is that Putin has identified himself with the identity crisis and is trying to restore the power of Russia. And we cannot let that happen. And if cyber is the tool, we do, in fact, have to figure out how to deal with it. They are not, however, the only country that has capabilities. And so I think this is the challenge of our time. And it will take 
all of us working together. And which is why I do think that having us here together is very important. You haven't asked me about my pin. Uh, I have on a, uh, a Lincoln pin that says, one country, one people. And I thought that was an appropriate one to wear tonight. Could I, thank you, could I thank you, Madeline, for your leadership of the NDI? Can I thank all of you who are the wonderful men and women who serve at NDI and IRI? And thank all of you tonight for being here in support of these wonderful organizations, which Madeline and I are privileged to be yeah. part of. And I thank you, Fred. Thank you. And I think we'd like to thank these people for working so hard for yeah. these values. <laughs>